Hey there, my name is Gary Sims, and this is Gary Explains. Now, when you write data to a storage medium, whether that's a hard drive, or an SSD, or an SD card, or a micro SD card, or a USB flash drive, you need to write the data in such a way that it can be found again. You can't just write it randomly on a two terabyte drive and then hope that you'll trip over it one day when you need it. It needs to be organized, and that organization is called a file system. Now, as with many things in computers, there are many, many types of file systems in this world, and there are many, many ones to choose from. Now, when it comes to the world of Windows, there are three main file systems that are important. That's NTFS, XFAT, and FAT32. And today I want to look at those three and discover the differences between them and talk about which ones you should be using. So if you want to find out more, please let me explain. So as I said, when you store a file on a disk, the operating system needs to know where the file is physically located. It needs to have a way to associate a file name with that file contents. Plus there might be other things like folders, file permissions, etc., that need to be associated with each file. Now this structure, how the raw data is organized on the disk is called a file system. Now you create a file system when you format a drive, which in the Linux world would be make file system or MKFS. And so format, and make file system are synonymous in this context. Now, just like computer programming languages or JavaScript frameworks, there are many types of file systems. And as I already mentioned on Windows, we're gonna be looking at FAT32, XFAT and NTFS. To name a few others, HFS, HFS Plus and APFS are Apple's file systems. And on Linux, of course, you've got EXT4, XFS, JFS, uh, ButterFS, ZFS, and so on. Now, one key thing to note is that some OSs can understand file systems from other operating systems. So for example, Mac OS can understand FAT32, and that will be important for us to look at in a moment. So let's start with FAT32. In fact, let's start with FAT8. So FAT8, FAT12, FAT16, and FAT32. Now back in the late 70s, Microsoft produced its first version of a file system called FAT, file allocation table, FAT. It was originally developed to course for use with floppy disks. However, over the years now, it's found its way onto hard drive, USB flash drives, and SSD cards. And it was the default file system for Windows up until Windows XP when NTFS took over, and we'll talk more about that in a moment. Now, there have been several different variations of FAT based around the size of the table, because it's a file allocation table that holds information about the files. And as I mentioned, that's FAT8, FAT12, FAT16, and FAT32. The original FAT used 8-bit entries, and it's today referred to as FAT8, then came FAT12, and then when we had our first hard drives in the IBM PC AT, we got FAT16. And from Windows 95 release 2, we got FAT32. Nowadays, FAT32 is almost universally understood not only by PCs running Windows, but also Linux and Mac OS, but also cameras, media players, game consoles, smart TVs, Android phones, and so on. But it has some limits. The native disk's maximum disk size for FAT32 is 32 gigabytes. Uh, up to two terabytes is possible with third-party tools, not necessarily using the default Windows tools. And there is a theoretical maximum of 16 uh, terabytes. However, there is a fixed maximum size of a file, which is four gigabytes, and there's no way around it. Four gigabytes is the biggest file possible on a FAT32 system. Now, FAT32 is the official format for SD and SDHC cards. So that's SD is up to two gigabytes, SDHC up to 32 gigabytes. That is the official format for those cards. And it's also therefore also the de facto standard for many USB flash drives and even some types of external hard drives drives. So if we look here at the SD card format, you've got SD cards originally were up to two gigabytes, FAT32, SDHC, 32 gigabytes, FAT32. And then once you go over that 32 gigabytes, you've now got SDXC. That supports up to two terabytes and we use XFAT, which is something we're going to be talking about in a minute. So notice the difference when you get a bigger SD card, it actually changes the file system. And it's important to know that because sometimes you might get caught out because a, a 32 gigabyte card might work in a particular camera or a TV or media player. And then you put in a bigger one, it doesn't work and you don't know why. And it might be because of the file system difference. 
So since we mentioned XFAT, let's have a look at that. It's the extended file allocation table. It's another Microsoft de design. It was first introduced in 2006 as part of Windows CE 6.0. It allows for files larger than four gigabytes. That's important. And it was adopted by the SD Card Association for the default file system of cards greater than 32 gigabytes. And its limits, we could talk about the limits, but really they're measured in petabytes and exabytes. So not something we need to worry about quite now. Now, what's interesting is since FAT32 and XFAT belong to Microsoft, this is in fact how Microsoft has made billions of dollars in the past from ecosystems like Android and also other things like media players and smart TVs, because if an OEM wanted to use FAT32 or XFAT, it needed to pay a license fee to Microsoft. Now that situation may have slightly changed with Microsoft softening its approach to uh, Linux and of course, Android is um, based on Linux. However, I'm pretty sure that Microsoft are still making money from uh, licensing FAT32 and XFAT, particularly XFAT, because I have a Synology uh, NAS drive. I've done a review about it here on this channel. And if you want XFAT access on that Synology, this is a commercial product that I bought, paid hundreds of dollars for it. If you actually want to be able to uh, access XFAT drives, you need to pay an extra $4. So I need to pay that to Synology. They'll give me a license thing. It will work out here. It gets activated on the drive. And I'm pretty sure that a big chunk of that $4 goes directly to Microsoft. Okay, moving away from XFAT now onto NTFS. NT stands for new technology. That's what Windows NT, NTFS, the new technology file system was developed for Windows NT 3.1. And it was a default file system for all of the Windows NT a uh, family of uh, operating system right up, of course, until Windows XP, which kind of combined NT and the traditional Windows uh, framework together and you get XP onwards. And then NTFS became the default uh, for Windows, including Windows 10, which you may well be using today. Again, the file sizes are measured in exabytes, so 16 exabytes, so not something we have to worry about. However, there are some differences with NTFS that you don't get in FAT32 or in XFAT. You get file permissions, there is compression, and there is encry encryption. These are all built in at the file system level. But the biggest difference is that NTFS is a journaling file system. Now, what do I mean by that? There are two types of data that is stored when you actually write some data to a disk. There's the actual file content, so the actual pixels, the data that's making up the pixels of your photograph you're storing, and then some metadata about the file. So that might be the file name, its permissions, what folder it's in, and so on. Now, when you delete a file, you don't actually delete the data, the file contents. All you need to do is remove that metadata saying, this file, the index to it, this file no longer exists, so I'm destroying it. The actual data can remain on the hard drive or on the, uh, the flash drive because it will just get over it naturally as things progress onto the drive. And it's the same with a rename or moving a file to another folder. You don't actually need to move the physical data. You just need to move the file that points to it, the metadata that points to it, and say, well, actually, now this file's been moved into this directory. Actually, it's the same file. We won't rewrite the, the three gigabytes on the hard drive. We'll just change those few bytes of metadata so that it's now pointing that it's in a different folder uh, on your hard drive. Now, some of these operations we talked about, deleting and renaming, take multiple steps. So for example, if you wanted to rename a file, you might need to create the new file metadata in its new folder, and then you might want to remove the old metadata. You certainly don't want to leave it in limbo where you've removed it before you've created the new one. But if the system does crash between those two steps, the file system is now in an inconsistent state. Now, of course, this is a simple example. There are some more complicated operations that happen on a file system that could leave it in a significantly inconsistent state where what's on the hard drive and what's in the metadata don't match up. Now, a journal stores the intention of the file system before it starts. This is the important thing. It says, I'm about to do these operations. OK, and the journal records what the OS wanted to do. And then once it's done all those things, the operation is complete. Now, if a crash occurs in between these operations that is already written into the journal, then the OS at reboot looks at the journal and says, right, let's see whether how far along we got. And it looks at the files. It looks at the metadata. Says, oh, I see. We're in the middle of doing a rename here. We're in the middle of doing a delete. I know what I need to do to carry on. And by reapplying, going over the journal again and checking the steps, 
you can actually bring the file system up to a more consistent state very, very quickly, which ultimately reduces system corruption due to unexpected restarts. Now, the thing to emphasize is you don't get this on FAT32 or XFAT. This is something you get on NTFS. You also get it on other file systems like EXT4, for example. You also get it on uh, Apple's uh, file system, but it's not what you get on your traditional SD card. Now, the thing about NTFS is it's got a compatibility issue. It's very much a Windows thing, as I said, right back to Windows NT. Now, there are some clean room implementations for Linux and uh, Mac OS, not written by Microsoft. Other people have had a go understanding the way NTFS works. So there is Mac OS support for reading, read-only support on uh, NTFS. Linux has support for read-only since way back the Linux kernel 2.2. And there is now also this project called NTFS 3G, which does have read and write support. However, there are often questions around performance and compatibility because these are all coming from that kind of clean room implementation, trying to guess how it's working, not coming from Microsoft. So overall, it's okay if you want to access an NTFS drive because you happen to have one plugged in and you need to get some data off it, something you might do occasionally, but certainly not something you would use as a primary file system outside of the Windows ecosystem. So then that brings us to the question, which one should you use? Well, obviously, if you're using a PC or a laptop of some kind, then you need to use the native file system for that OS. So NTFS for Windows 10, APFS for Mac OS, and then EXT4, XFS, or whatever is the default file system for your Linux distro. When it comes to other things like SD cards, then things get a bit more tricky. So SD cards use FAT32 by default if it's smaller than 32 gigabytes. XFAT if it's greater, but some devices don't support XFAT. So if you read around some of the consoles, the older generations of consoles, the Raspberry Pi, for example, can't boot from an XFAT uh, SD card, even when it's greater than 32 gigabytes. So you have to be able to find a way to format some of these cards using FAT32 to give you that greater uh, compatibility. Now you can do that using uh, the well-known program Rufus, just type in Rufus, uh, and you'll find that on Google, or the Raspberry Pi Imager, both of those can format FAT32 drives greater than 32 gigabytes. So a, a useful tool when you've got another device, a camera, a console, Raspberry Pi that you wanna use, 128 gigabyte SD card, but you need to use it in FAT32. Now for external hard drives, of course, if you're just using it on your Windows PC on your Mac, then you just format it using the native OS. I have an external hard drive for one of my older Mac and I just use it in the Mac uh, format uh, that it was using uh, APFS because I'm not taking it from one machine to another. It's used there just to expand the storage on my Mac. However, for external hard drives that will be used on multiple devices. So if you're taking a, a small portable drive, one terabyte, two terabytes, whatever, from one PC to another, from one computer to another, even plugging it into a console, plugging it into a smart TV, into a media player, then you're going to need to use a file system that's understood. So that's not NTFS. You're definitely going to want to be using XFAT or FAT32. And the same rules apply, as I mentioned here. It depends on whether your device understands XFAT or whether you're going to need to use it in FAT32 and format it using one of these extra tools that can allow you to format that drive uh, using the older file system. The good news is that as we go on, more and more devices are understanding XFAT, newer game consoles understand XFAT, and so on. However, there may always be this case when you need to use FAT32 to maintain compatibility between multiple devices. Okay, that's it. My name is Gary Sims, and this is Gary Explains. Now, if you like this video, please do give it a thumbs up. Also, it's best not to rely on the YouTube recommendation algorithm because it may not have showed you this video. Instead, it's better to subscribe and hit that bell notification icon. Okay, that's it. I'll see you in the next one.